Hey there everybody, Professor Tomney here, and I am back with another Chem Complete video. This is a follow-up to some of the recent videos that I've been putting out on the channel, and this one is going to be a very elementary beginner's guide to Lewis structures. So this is usually the way that I would approach Lewis dot structures with a middle school class. When you get to upper school, high school chemistry and college level chemistry, the ways that the atoms can arrange themselves get far more complex, especially as d orbitals open up and things like that. So keep in mind that while you are watching this, this is a more simplistic version of how to deal with Lewis structures. And it's really going to limit us primarily to the first three rows of elements, really the first two, but we can kind of throw the third row of elements in there. Okay, so this is going to be Lewis structures sort of 101 or for beginners. So Lewis structures can really be applied to any atom or any compound, but generally speaking, we usually reserve Lewis structures primarily for covalent bonding. So if you remember last time on the most recent video I did, it was for ionic bonding. And in ionic bonding, we had a metal and a nonmetal. So when we start talking about covalent bonding, covalent bonding is going to be two nonmetals. That are coming together or two or more because you don't have to just limit yourself to two it's going to be a non-metal bonding with other non-metals okay whereas ionic was a metal with a non-metal and the big difference here is that when we start dealing with covalent bonding we're going to be dealing with sharing electrons instead of a transfer of electrons like we would expect in ionic bonding where the metal is going to transfer the electrons over to the nonmetal. And so one of the ways that we help show a shared set of electrons in a compound is by drawing a line between them. And you may have seen something similar to this when you have come across, let's say for instance, water. So you've got H2O and it's got a line to the oxygen and another line to the other hydrogen. Okay, and then there's some dots there. Now maybe you've seen some different version of this. But generally speaking, that's how we represent shared electrons. So if you were to come over and take a look at the line here that we can circle in blue, these lines represent electrons that are being shared between the hydrogen and the oxygen, right? So this bond right here is two electrons being shared back and forth between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So that's the premise of covalent bonding. But in order to understand how we draw these structures, we first have to understand where these various dots and lines come from. And one of the first ways that we can look at that is by evaluating what we call Lewis dot structures for individual elements. And so a Lewis dot structure is going to look at the electrons in an atom or element's outer shell. So we're not worried about the total number of electrons that are present in the atom, only the electrons that we find in the outer shell. And there's good reason for this. That's because the electrons that are in the outer shell are the highest energy electrons, and therefore they are also the most reactive and most likely to bond. And so when we start talking about bonding, it's the electrons that are in the outer shell. The proper term we use for that is valence electrons. The valence shell is the outermost shell. Okay, but again, for most of my middle school classes, I talk about it just as the outer shell. And so when you're in your outer shell, you can count how many electrons should be placed there by simply going across the various energy levels. So for instance, if I take a look at the first energy level, it is hydrogen and helium because we go across the periodic table this way when we're dealing with filling up energy shells. So I go and I look, hydrogen and helium are going to be the first two elements in shell one, and then I open up shell two, starting with lithium. And I go from lithium all the way up to neon, and then I move on to shell three, which is going to start with sodium. So if you look at all of the various shells, you'll find your element in one of them, and you need to figure out how far into the shell you have to go in order to reach your element. That is the number of electrons in the outer shell, and that is the number of dots that you should show in your Lewis dot structure. So let's take a look at a couple examples here 
And as I go along, try to keep up and figure out what I'm talking about as I sort of point various things out here. So let's say that I start with hydrogen. Well, hydrogen is found in the very first row going across the periodic table, and it's the first element in the first energy shell. And because I only have to go one element deep, I only have one electron that would be associated with a hydrogen. And so, so I show that as a dot somewhere around the hydrogen. Now, normally, when we take a look at an element, so you can just call it element X, we will fill in electrons one at a time, and it can be on any of the four sides. So you could do it in the top, you could draw it at the bottom, you could draw it on the right, or you can draw it on the left. Only after we have reached four electrons, if we have additional, do we start pairing them up. So you could have a pair on top and then three of them that are unpaired around the other areas. You could have two of them that come as pairs and two that are unpaired. And this pairing and unpairing becomes important because it's going to tell us about bonding. So let's continue to take a look at some of these other elements here, keeping this general format in mind. You do one electron at a time around all sides until you reach that point where you have four, and then you can start pairing up. Okay, so let's take a look at lithium and move all the way across the table to neon. So we go to lithium. Lithium is in shell two, because I'm starting the new row here. Hydrogen and helium would be shell one, Lithium would be shell two. And so with lithium, I go one element deep and I'm done. So I only need a single dot. Again, you can put it on any of the four sides. It doesn't really matter. Then I get to beryllium. Beryllium is going to have two electrons. And so I write one and two. Again, they could be on any of the sides, but they should not be on the same side, meaning they should not be paired up until we have one on each side. Then we jump over to boron. Boron is three elements in to its energy shell. And so we do one, two, three, and continue likewise. So carbon is going to be one, two, three, four. Again, if you're following along, here's one, that would be lithium. Here's two, beryllium. Here's three, boron. And here's four. We're at carbon. So again, going this way, is what we associate with the energy shell. So we're gonna fill it until we get all the way to neon and then we open up a new energy shell and we continue forward from there. So if I keep going, nitrogen is going to be five. Now once I get to five, I'm going to have one on each side and that means that I can now make a pair. So you can put it on any of the sides. I'll just go ahead and put it here. And so nitrogen has one pair and three that are single electrons, meaning they're not paired up on that side. Then we go to oxygen. Oxygen is going to have six. So we do one, two, three, four, five, six. Fluorine is going to be seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then finally, neon, which is a noble gas, already has its shell complete. So it would have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if I evaluate these elements, there's two things that we want to consider. Number one is any of the unpaired electrons. So when you find electrons that are not paired, they will be available to pair up with an electron in a different element or atom, and that means that they will be available to create a bond. Anytime you find a pair that is together, those will not be available for bonding. So I can keep track of this down here by saying this is the bonding electrons, the ones that are not paired here. And then we'll use red as a separate color and come through. Anytime that I find pairs of electrons on the same side of the atom, those are going to be considered off limits. They are non-bonding pairs of electrons. And so we can write them as such, non-bonding 
electrons. So that doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that they're not going to be participating in any of the bonding that we show going on. And there's some truth to that. Again, at a middle school level, we're going to assume that that's true. Pairs can usually get involved in bonding way down the road when you start learning some upper level chemistry. But for now, we are going to assume that they cannot be linked up or react with anything else. So then the question becomes, okay, if I know how to put these dot structures together for individual elements, how can I start bringing them together in order to create compounds? And so one example that's easy to start with is water. Most people know that water is H2O. And so if I want to take a look at water, I can look at the structure of a hydrogen, which is going to be one dot, and then an oxygen, which is going to have six. Now, if I look at this, remember that the unpaired electrons are the only ones that can form a bond. And so that means that this grouping right here can link up to form a bond with one another. But I still have an unpaired one down here. And so what I would need is another hydrogen to bring a single electron to the table. And then I can talk about there being a bond between that last set right there. And so what this represents is two electrons. One is being brought from the hydrogen and one is being brought from the oxygen. And these two electrons are going to be shared between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And the same thing here, there's going to be two electrons that will be shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen. And so if I wanted to represent the structure of water, I simply take these shared links here, or these electrons that are pairing up, and I draw them as a line. So I could say I have H that is linked up to oxygen. So that's one bond, this one right here, right? And then I could say, all right, I have another one that's right here. That would be this one down there. And then it's important you don't forget the pairs that are still there. So even though they didn't get involved with another element or bond, they are still present. And that means we need to show them around the oxygen. And so this would be the structure of water based on that. So to show you another example, instead of oxygen, what happens if we use nitrogen? So nitrogen is going to have a total of five electrons instead of six. The hydrogens will still have one apiece. So what we're going to find is nitrogen would have one, two, three, four, five. And then the hydrogens would have one. So how many hydrogens am I going to need in order to form these bonds? Well, I still have two that are unpaired, and so I need two additional ones in order to work with this. Right? And so I would represent this as N, and then there would be three bonds. Each of them would go to a hydrogen. And then finally, I need to remember that I have a non-bonding electron pair on top of the nitrogen. This would be NH3, which is another common compound. We call that ammonia. So similar to water, ammonia, you can determine the structure if you look at this pairing. Now again, the rules, as you get into compounds that are more complex, there's a whole set of rules that you follow. You can't just link up the dots back and forth. But this is an excellent way to start and to understand Lewis structures, especially some of the simpler compounds. Okay, so to give you two other examples, let's take a look at HCl and CH4. So we have hydrochloric acid and we have methane. So for hydrochloric acid, we know that we've got a hydrogen. Now come up to the periodic table and look at chlorine. So chlorine is right here, and if I count, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 elements into the periodic table, okay? And therefore, 
or not the periodic table, but seven into the row, that row of the periodic table. So I need seven, right? The chlorine's going to need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that leaves one unpaired electron on the hydrogen and one unpaired on the chlorine. So this is a perfect match. We'll link that up. And the structure for hydrochloric acid is HCl. And the Cl needs to have its pairs that did not get involved in the bonding. And I can do this again with CH4. Carbon should have four of them. One, two, three, four. And then hydrogen would have one apiece. So you can hopefully see what's going to happen here. I'm going to form a bond one time. And then if there's a total of four hydrogens, I'm going to do it four times over in order to get the structure of methane. And so methane would have the four lines all attached to hydrogens representing those bonds. Okay. Now, sometimes it may not just be a single bond. So when you have examples that we've shown so far, it's good because we can just link up a needed number of hydrogens. But what happens when you start taking away hydrogens? So for instance, what about the structure of carbon dioxide? Well, carbon is going to have four. And then if you look at an oxygen, an oxygen is going to have six. So we would say one, two, three, four, and then I'm going to do five, six, right? So I have an unpaired set here, and then I have another unpaired set here. And so what I'm going to do in order to link the carbon and the oxygen is create what's called a double bond instead of just one regular single covalent bond. And now on the other side, I'm going to take a look at the oxygen because it's CO2, there's two of them. And I'll say, okay, one, two, three, four, right? Five, six. And so again, I can link up the unpaired dots, which represent electrons. And what I have is oxygen double bonded to carbon, and then that carbon double bonds to an oxygen again. And so the structure of this would be carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and that oxygen still has its pairs, and then carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Again, the oxygen should still have its pairs. And that would be carbon dioxide. So you can create double bonds and you can create triple bonds. Generally, we stay away from quadruple bonds. They tend to be more difficult to work with. And they are in very, very rare isolated cases. They are not going to be common in most of the structures that we come across. But single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds are most definitely valid ways to pair up elements. Now, one of the key goals here is that when you get to the end of a structure, there should no longer be any unpaired electrons. You can't leave the electrons just sitting around unpaired. They should be matched up with other elements in order to provide them with the electrons that they need. Okay, so that is pretty much a good roughly 20 minute summary on how to deal with Lewis dot structures for the individual elements and then how you bring them together and start forming compounds. You're really looking for the unpaired dots, which represent unpaired electrons. And those unpaired electrons are going to find a partner or a pair, they're gonna make a pair, from another element atom that's coming in and getting involved in that bonding relationship. So that is it for this lesson. This again was sort of the introduction. If you are in a upper school or a college level course, I would encourage you to search the channel out because I do have the higher level uh, material in regards to Lewis structures if you want to work with some of the more complicated structures. Uh, and that's definitely how you should approach it if you're at that upper level. So everybody take care and I will see you in the next video.